there could have been pre-Christ baptisms and infant baptism in the cultural context. Early theological controversies over these topics didn't necessarily originate in 19th century America, and these could have been disputes the Nephites were having anciently, and some of those things could have been having if there was early Christology, they had these Christian doctrines and teachings, then it's very possible that they could have been having similar disputes and discussions over these things. Mormonism with the Murph, where Larry Singh explores church history and the church's truth claims. Hello everyone, and welcome back to my channel. In the last episode, we had a look at Protestant Christianity in the Book of Mormon. Specifically, we had a look at King Benjamin's speech versus Bishop McKendry. Was Joseph Smith just drawing upon a revivalist preacher and sermons in his day and putting that into the Book of Mormon. And we also had a look at people's conversion experiences, having born again, forgiveness experiences. And was he just drawing upon people's conversion experiences from the 19th century, specifically Methodist Christianity, and putting that into his Book of Mormon. And we had a look at some of the critical conclusions and some apologetic responses. Uh, in this video, we're going to be continuing on from the last video. Does the Book of Mormon reflect 19th century theology? Uh, and is this just a 19th century text reflecting and addressing a lot of the 19th century controversies uh, that were happening in 19th century America? And we're going to talk about that in this episode. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint that we have. And let's dive in. So I'm going to start with a quote from Richard Bushman. This came from an interview when he was on Mormon discussions years ago. He says, I think right now the Book of Mormon is a puzzle for us, even for people who believe in it in every detail. It's a puzzle. To begin with, we've got the puzzle of translation, translating the book without the plates even in sight, wrapped up in a cloth on the table. It's not something that comes right off the pages. That is the characters on the plates. So we don't even know how that works. And then there's the fact that there's phrasing everywhere, long phrases that if you Google them, you'll find them in 19th century writings. The theology of the Book of Mormon is very much 19th century theology, and it reads like a 19th century understanding of the Hebrew Bible as an Old Testament. That is, it has Christ in it, the way Protestants saw Christ everywhere in the Old Testament. So we're talking about how it's a bit of a puzzle, the uh, understanding of translation, how the Book of Mormon was translated, because there are these 19th century phrases in the Book of Mormon. We had a look in the last episode at some of the 19th century Methodist evangelical phrases uh, some of the similarities between either some of the sermons or people's conversion experiences. And, you know, we talked about the different ways that you could interpret or, or harmonize that, either Joseph Smith as a co-participant, translating an ancient text and having to translate in his own vocabulary and terminology, which is why these evangelical Protestant phrases are making their way through. You could also argue that this is uh, you know, God's translation onto the stone, wanted to be in 19th century uh, vocabulary uh, with the King James Bible for it to be relevant to the religious people of the time. Uh, and he also talks about how there is 19th century theology, how Christ is all the way throughout the Book of Mormon, even before Christ comes. They know the name of Christ. I believe it's revealed to Jacob and then King Benjamin as well by revelation uh, and by an angel, similar to how the Christians saw Christ throughout the Old Testament as well. So that can be a bit of a puzzle. And this is why critics would say that the Book of Mormon has 19th century phrases, phraseology, uh, sermons, and theology. Alexander Campbell, who was a Campbellite, leader of the Campbellite movement, uh, and a critic of Joseph Smith, said, uh, so he's a founder of the Disciples of Christ. And he said, this prophet Smith, through his stone spectacles, wrote on the plates of Nephi in his Book of Mormon, every error and almost every truth discussed in New York for the last 10 years. He decided all the great controversies, infant baptism, ordination, the trinity, regeneration, repentance, justification, the fall of man, the atonement, transubstantiation, fasting, penance, church government, religious experience, the call of the ministry, the general resurrection, eternal punishment, who may baptize, and even the questions of Freemasonry, Republican government, and the rights of man. A lot of critics would uh, quote this uh, quite famous quote from Alexander Campbell supporting that the Book of Mormon addresses all the 19th century controversies and religious topics of the day. We're going to discuss some of these. And is this an anachronism? Is this a 19th century element? And does this show that this Joseph Smith is the author and this is just a 19th century text? 
and we're going to look at some of the faithful responses as well. Uh, so building on from this, Protestant theology in the Book of Mormon, this comes from a uh, critic. Have you ever wondered why the ancient Native Americans were giving sermons relating to the popular controversial topics of the early 19th century, such as the validity of infant baptism, the abominations of the churches, which church was right, antichrist, and even the dangers of secret combinations? These were prevalent topics in Joseph Smith's day, and much of the source material for the Book of Mormon has been discovered within the elements of his environment. It is important that we understand that these source materials were vital to the remix process that resulted in the Book of Mormon. So this critic is concluding and interpreting the Book of Mormon, addressing many of these topics, such as the nature of salvation, infant baptism, that these are 19th century elements, that this is Joseph Smith in his oral dictation doing a remix, taking things from his environment, from his religious milieu. And that is what is coming out in his dictation of the Book of Mormon. You know, everything's a remix. So this is just coming from his environment, from the revival sermons and the conversion experiences that he was witnessing. We're going to be diving into some of the specific ones. We can't cover every single 19th century element that Campbell lists. And anti-masonry, we're going to do a separate video on that specifically. But this would be the, the critic sort of argument about 19th century theology in the Book of Mormon. Christopher Stalmas, who is a scholar, uh, he was interviewed on Gospel Tangents. Uh, he's a Pentecostal as well. And he had to say, well, aside from the fall and aside from Jesus appearing so often so early, the Book of Mormon is pretty kind of Protestant. I think Campbell was right about all the theological scores it settles. We don't do infant baptism. We baptize by immersion. People who practice infant baptism, they wouldn't think it's generally Protestant, but they would know people. I heard Walter Brueggemann, who's a great Old Testament scholar, say once, do I believe in infant baptism? I've seen it done. So you could find the stream that theologically it fits within. I've been working on a presentation article for the Journal of a Book of Mormon Studies on the study of the Book of Mormon the Theology. And some of those, like a couple of things Terrell Givens has written, he'll basically say it's not terribly distinctive in that regard. There are a lot of ways when you're reading through it with King Benjamin, I've been to lots and lots of services that resemble what gets described there and the response and such. For the most part on the theology, it's not terribly controversial, except for a couple of caveats. There's a bit of difference here and there on atonement, but for the most part, it's rather orthodox, you might say. So Christopher Thomas's view on the theology of the Book of Mormon, that other than perhaps maybe the fall, because in the Book of Mormon, it discusses that the fall is sort of a necessary part of God's plan, almost a step forward and progression in the plan of salvation and something they would do with the atonement. But all the things would harmonize with Protestant Christianity in there, and he compared, you know, King Benjamin's sermon being similar to a revivalist sermon or preacher. Now, we did talk about that more in the last episode, so go back and watch that, where we talked about a faithful scholarly response being that, yes, there are some parallels to King Benjamin's sermon being similar to a revivalist sermon, being erected on a tar, calling the people to repentance, there being a conviction of their sins, them turning to Christ for mercy. But scholars such as Blake Oster point to that there are ancient covenant renewal festival themes and parallels to that, pointing to some ancient antiquity and also coronation and the consecration of Mosiah, his son, which are, which are different to a revivalist sermon. So this is what Fair has to say on 19th century theology. Theological anachronisms are theological ideas that are thought to be out of place given contemporary intellectual trajectories. For example, critics claim that the Book of Mormon's anti-universalist rhetoric is merely a product of Joseph Smith's religious environment and not historical prophets responding to historical groups within their own ideas. Uh, Dan Vogel the... would advocate that Joseph Smith's father was a universalist and the Book of Mormon Part of the motivation for Joseph Smith writing the Book of Mormon was to solve the religious disputes among his family members, his father's dreams, his father's universalism, and the Book of Mormon is very much, much an anti-universalist book. Some people might say that the Book of Mormon is coming from Joseph Smith rather than these historical prophets responding to these historical groups with their own ideas, these theological ideas and doctrines. An old saying tells us that there isn't really a new idea under the sun. That's generally true. There's merely the first person to articulate, record, and promulgate an idea. This may be particularly true with things like theology. 
Humans have been religious animals and have been trying to understand the heavens and God since the dawn of time. Once you keep this in mind, the writers of scripture could be the ones to be the actual first in articulating a new idea. An assumption that many Latter-day Saints forget when approaching these types of questions is that revelation is real and it's a valid source of knowledge. Revelation could have been given spontaneously to the ancient writers of scripture for them to record. This revelation could have taken place outside the recorded text in some instances. We learn that God speaks unto one nation as he does to others. Another principle to remember is that people can explain vastly different ideas using very similar rhetoric, and the differences are thus going to be hard to tease out. But if one wants to respond well to claims of theological anachronisms, they should be prepared to take a really close look at the rhetoric being used to support a particular idea. How that rhetoric might be slightly different in the Book of Mormon or other restoration scripture, and how given those subtle differences in rhetoric, the ideas being communicated may be different than what a critic alleges. So one thing that they're saying is that, you know, humans, they've been religious animals from the very beginning and early Christians would have been probably having similar disputes and discussions uh, about different Christian questions relating to baptism, authority, the nature of God. And these are not perhaps just unique to Protestant 19th century Christianity. And if the Nephites had early Christology, it's not surprising that perhaps they could have been having similar disputes and discussions about some of these doctrinal topics. I know to a critic, they would say it's more likely that it's just Joseph Smith taking it from his environment and then attributing it to these fictional uh, ancient characters. So why Christology before Christ in the Book of Mormon? So this comes from a critic LDS discussions. He says, as we pointed out already throughout these sections, Book of Mormon features a Christology that was not developed historically until after Jesus's life, hundreds of years before Jesus even arrives. The Book of Mormon includes being baptized in the name of Christ over 150 years before Jesus would be baptized. While I understand the apologetic argument, is that they received the concept of baptism through revelation. The Book of Mormon people are being baptized in Christ's name before Christ even dies and before the atonement of Jesus Christ. So he's pointing to this as this seems like a 19th century element. It almost seems anachronistic. Uh, people baptizing in the name of Christ, people knowing Jesus Christ's name, talking about his atonement. And there wouldn't have been this in the Old Testament. Now I know John the Baptist was doing baptisms before Christ, before his ministry, uh, but some critics would point to this as a 19th century element in the text, and that Joseph Smith is probably just taking this because he had the New Testament, and this was his environment. He was familiar with Protestant Christianity and the New Testament, more so than maybe the Law of Moses and the Old Testament. So let's look at some responses to this. Uh, yes. Science has to say, some have criticized 2 Nephi 25 for referring to Jesus Christ as a name, and that prior to the New Testament era, first of all, it is apparent that inspired Book of Mormon writers knew that the titles Christ and Messiah were synonyms. As John 1 41 tells us, Book of Mormon authors repeatedly refer to the Lord as Jesus the Christ or as the Messiah. And I believe in 1 Nephi, it refers to him a lot as the Messiah. Arthur E. Glass, a Jewish Christian scholar, has observed that Isaiah 62 verse 11, and several other Old Testament verses translated as my salvation or thy salvation should properly be translated as the name Yeshua, which is the shortened form of the name Yahushua. I'm probably saying that completely wrong. Uh, I do not know Hebrew. This would lead to the conclusion that Nephi and other prophets could have known the Lord's name in their own language. In Hebrew, Jesus the Messiah would have been called Yeshua Hamashiach, but Joseph Smith translated the Nephite name for him as Jesus Christ, the anglicized Greek equivalent we use today. See also September 1984 Enzyme. It should be noted that by the time Mormon wrote his synopsis of Nephite history, he knew quite well how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies that had been made about him before his birth. He could have done a lot to straighten out differences in terminology that might otherwise have been confusing to us. It was common for writers to change details of prophecies after they had been completed to match the details of of completion. So Fair are suggesting that, uh, according to the Jewish Christian scholar, that uh, the ancient Jews would have known that the early Jews, you know, Nephi and the other prophets 
would have known the name of the Lord in their own language, Yeshua, would have been called Yeshua Hamashiach, and that this is either perhaps uh, Joseph Smith's translation of the name on the gold plates, or it could be that it's Mormon in his redaction as he's editing the plates would know uh, Jesus's name. But I, I think probably just it being a translation would solve that issue. But I think the, the question is, why did they know Jesus Christ's name before Jesus came? It was by revelation in the Book of Mormon by an angel visiting. Uh, but does this seem out of place? Like, why would they know about Jesus and be baptizing in the name of Jesus uh, before the Jews in the Old Testament? Uh, so this is what Blake Oster has to say about just Christianity in the Book of Mormon. What then can be concluded from the presence of developed Christian documents, doctrines in the Old Testament sections of the Book of Mormon? James H. Charlesworth, an expert in the Pseudepigrapha, quoted Mosiah 3, 8 to 10. He observed, in these three verses, we find what most critical scholars would call clearly Christian phrases. That is, the description is so precise that it is evidence it was added after the event. And we talk about some, you know, Christian phrases in the last episode, which you could attribute to Joseph Smith as the translator, co-participant, perhaps an expansion. Uh, he goes on to say, how are we to evaluate this new observation? Does it not vitiate the claim that this section of the Book of Mormon, Mosiah, was written before 91 BC? Not necessarily, since Mormons acknowledge that the Book of Mormon could have been edited and expanded on at least two occasions that postdate the life of Jesus of Nazareth. It is claimed that the prophet Mormon abridged some parts of the Book of Mormon in the 4th century AD. It is likewise evidence that Joseph Smith in the 19th century had the opportunity to redact the traditions he claimed to have received. So these early Christian phrases, these Christian elements in the Book of Mormon could either be attributed to Mormon in his redaction of the plates who would have had access to Jesus Christ's name and uh, Christian theology, or it could be Joseph Smith uh, in his 19th century translation. Though I am informed that Charlesworth does not consider the Book of Mormon to be an ancient document, his hypothesis should still be taken seriously. The Christian motifs in the Book of Mormon require either that a Christian has been at work during some stage of the compilation, or that it is Christian in origin. A study of the editorial tendencies may determine whether the Christian motifs derive from Mormon or from Joseph Smith, in 1st and 2nd Nephi, Jacob and Enos, however, expansions must come from Joseph Smith because the small plates were not abridged by Mormon. So you could say that these Christian motifs and elements could have come from Mormon in his abridgment or Joseph Smith as the translator because Mormon wouldn't have abridged the small plates. Uh, but you could say that it, they were just Christian in origin and if it was revealed to them by revelation to Jacob and King Benjamin, then that could be a possible explanation for why we have Christianity in the Book of Mormon, early Christology. What about the things like the devil in the Book of Mormon and referring to a church? Blake Oster says in 1 Nephi 13 to 15 can be distinguished as Joseph Smith's expansion through motif criticism. Its denunciations of the devil's great and abominable church depend on revelation and appears to express anti-capitalism characteristic of 19th century New York. I know that some early church leaders interpreted the Great and Abominable Church as the Catholic Church. That's no longer the church's official position, but I know that's how some had interpreted it in the past. I think maybe Bruce R. McConkie. These chapters contain ideas foreign to pre-exilic Israelites, such as a church, a personal devil, Jews and Gentiles. The expansion can be distinguished from the original text because of the angel's purpose in 1 Nephi 11 to 12 is to explain the symbolic significance of Lehi's vision. The interpretation ceases at 1 Nephi 12 to 18, and vision attributed to Nephi thereafter no longer explains Lehi's dream, but presents unrelated prophecies of very specific historical events, including the discovery of America. Okay, so Blake Oster is arguing that some of the things that are talked about in 1 Nephi 13 to 15, that this could be Joseph Smith's expansion or explanation because this is the angel showing and explaining to Nephi the symbolism and the meaning of Lehi's dream. So him seeing, you know, the devil and the great and abominable church and referring to, you know, Jews and Gentiles. That these ideas would have been foreign to the Jews. And he's attributing this to Joseph Smith in his 
expansion. I understand to a critic, they might say that oh, this is sort of convenient. And is this distinguishable from just coming from Joseph Smith? But this this could be one way to understand maybe some of the 19th century phrases, which might not have been familiar to the Jews and Joseph's role as the translator. Perhaps this was an expansion. Perhaps also this was just what uh, Nephi was being was being revealed to Nephi as well. I think you could allow possibility for that as well. So why baptizing in the name of Jesus? So this comes from Book of Mormon Evidence. In first century Judaism, baptism had a different meaning. In the book of Leviticus, God instructs Jews to cleanse themselves from ritual impurities contracted through such acts, such as touching a corpse or a leper, so it's part of the Mosaic law. While Christians may relate to baptism as a sign of covenant and purity before God, these still don't bridge the gap to John the Baptist's baptism of repentance or to the messianic thrust of his message. So where did yeah John the Baptist come and him doing baptisms of repentance for the remission of sins? That was before Christ's ministry. Did that come from this Jewish tradition of ritual cleansing? While there is still room for speculation, one possible bridge is the community of the Qumran, the ascetic desert sect, best known for creating the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like Orthodox Jews, the Qumran sectarians baptized for reasons of ritual purity. But their manual of discipline, or the community rule, also stated that a person could not become clean if he failed to obey God's commands. Uh, this is an editor's note. In my opinion, there is no need to speculate. We believe the Church of Jesus Christ has been on the earth since the time of Adam. As we see, as we see scripture above, we know Adam was baptized, and Christ was an eternal spirit, who helped create the world and has always been with us as the very God of Abraham. So it talks about in our scripture, in the book of Moses, about Adam exercising faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism by immersion. So it would be the belief of Latter-day Saints that these things would have been practiced from the beginning of time and didn't baptism didn't originate with John the Baptist. And perhaps this could have came from these early Jewish uh, rituals and cleansing. Now, I think I do have a slide uh, pushing back on this from Elias' discussions. Ferris says, for many years, most scholars claim that baptism, as Christians understand it, was unknown prior to New Testament times. Some scholars conceded that the Jews practiced the type of baptism, but they made a great effort to point out that the Jewish baptism was a ritual washing and it was very different from the unique Christian baptism. The Dead Sea Scrolls presented scholars with a wealth of information concerning ancient Jewish practices. Interestingly, a number of large water basins were discovered at Qumran. Nibley recalls that when he first visited Qumran in 1966, Christians and Jewish scholars vigorously denied that the tanks, basins, and water conduits connecting them had anything to do with baptisms or ritual ablutions. So it's possible that they were doing some early form of baptism, this ritual cleansing, uh, making covenants, and perhaps this is sort of the seeds of where the baptism came from. Critics' response to baptism, so this comes from LDS discussions, uh, so they're responding to the apologetics about these early Jewish ritual washings. When you take a step back, you quickly recognize that Tevila is really not that much like the ordinance of baptism. There are some physical similarities, but it is clearly not the gate that you must enter described by Nephi. It's clearly not a covenant between you and God that sets you on your life's journey and absolves you of your sins. It's part of the ritual washing and purification tenets of the Judaic law. There's no laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And of course, you have to say it, the tablet is decidedly not done in the name of Jesus Christ. Apologists would argue that John the Baptist was performing baptisms before Christ, which means that the revelation from God could have occurred before Christ's arrival. But that misses the point when we have Book of Mormon people doing it hundreds of years before Christ. So he's pushing back that apologists are maybe trying to make more of the evidence pointing to these early you know, Jewish uh, baptismal rituals that they were doing uh, in the Tevla, that there's some similarities but it's not the same as the baptism by emerging for the remission of your sins, entering the gate. So I saw about that in 2 Nephi 31. And that, you know, apologists would say that John the Baptist was baptizing before Jesus. So perhaps he received revelation. I think you could also just allow room that the, the Nephites could have received revelation about Christ hundreds of years before he came. 
and also the commandment to baptize in the name of Christ, I think is one way a believer could interpret it as well. But critics would say that apologists are maybe trying to make bigger of this evidence than maybe what it is to explain that, oh, the Jews were doing baptisms, so it's not a problem that Nephi and his people are talking about being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Blake Oster has to say this on baptism. Many Book of Mormon doctrines are best explained by the 19th century theological milieu. For example, though there may have been ritual washings performed in the tabernacle and temple, there are no pre exilic references to baptism. Yet Jacob explains repentance and baptism as if his hearers were completely familiar with the concept. He commandeth all men that they must repent and be baptized in his name, having perfect faith in the Holy One of Israel, or they cannot be saved in the kingdom of God. It is difficult to see this passage as anything but the Christian baptism of repentance necessary for salvation. Ritual washings were never seen as necessary to salvation in the Old Testament. It is interesting that immersion is not mentioned, given the controversy over the modes of baptism in Joseph's day. Though Nephi saw in vision Jesus baptized by John the Baptist, supposedly by immersion, the practice of baptism by immersion is first explicitly mentioned in the Book of Mormon, when Alma finds his community near the waters of Mormon. Alma does not, however, perform a Christian baptism. He baptized by authority from the Almighty God, and not in the name of Jesus Christ, and his, and his baptism is not associated symbolically with the death and resurrection of Christ, or the remission of sins, but symbolizes entering into a covenant with God. A striking parallel is the Qumran practice of ritual immersions as a sign of repentance upon entering a covenant and cleansing by the spirit of truth. So Blake Oster is almost agreeing uh, with you know, LDS discussions that the baptism talked about in the Book of Mormon, being baptized for the remission of your sins to be saved in the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ seems more like a 19th century theological uh, element than a ancient uh, Jewish element. He is acknowledging that there were ritual washings done uh, among the Jews and also the strong parallels between uh, the Qumran practice of ritual immersions, which uh, was a sign of sort of like their repentance and entering a covenant of cleansing before God and paralleling that with Alma and what he was doing, baptizing the people at the waters of Mormon. And perhaps it was something similar to that. But yeah, the the ritual washings, the ritual immersions were not seen as in the Old Testament as essential for salvation as it's talked about in the Book of Mormon, specifically in 2 Nephi 31. So this seems almost like a 19th century element. You could say that Nephi is writing this because of what he saw in vision, and this is his inspired writings. Uh, I know to a critic, they would just see that this is coming from Joseph Smith uh, from the New Testament and from 19th century Protestant Christianity and theology. So why infant baptism in the Book of Mormon? This comes from Book of Mormon Central. If I have learned the truth, there have been disputations among you concerning the baptism of your little children. This comes from Moroni chapter 8 verse 5. One important consideration is that Nephite children during Mormon's ministry were in danger of being captured by the Lamanites and offered up as sacrifices unto their idol gods. In this context, it is understandable that the parents may have had an increased anxiety for the welfare of their children. So that could perhaps have been the context for why they were discussing infant baptism out of fear about them being taken by the Lamanites. It's also plausible that infant baptism initially stemmed from outside of Nephite culture. Matthew Roper explained that in pre-Columbian America, Aztec midwives ritually bathed newborn children invoking the cleansing power of the goddess, I can't even say that, Chalchia Tilaku, I think. Implicit in the practice was the assumption that infants may inherit evil and impurity at birth. Roper concluded it is not difficult to imagine that Mormon and Moroni were resisting the similar cultural traditions which are making dangerous inroads into the Nephite Church of Christ. I think that's really interesting that in pre-Columbian America, the Aztec midwives would have done like ritual bathing of newborn children and if you believe in historical book of mormon that this could have been coming from their environment they're seeing these other people's doing similar ritual cleansing of their children and this could have been a theological doctrinal dispute and question they could have been having at this time and it's not necessarily a 19th century element or anachronism 
The controversy over infant baptism among the Nephites somewhat parallels the situation in Europe and the Near East, where the practice of baptizing infants emerged from among Christians in the third century AD and was controversial for some time. So infant baptism isn't just uh, relevant to Joseph Smith's time. Yes, they, there are probably discussions and disputes about that in 19th century early Christianity during the Second Great Awakening, but it's not original or unique just to that time that the early Christians would have been discussing and debating this and that there are some reasons both from the text of the Book of Mormon with the Lamanites perhaps taking the children and also in the culture the Mayan and the Aztecs would have done some similar ritual bathing of newborn children. So with this in mind it seems quite possible that Moroni included Mormon's letter because he understood either through vision or through some other spiritual manifestation, that infant baptism would be a huge topic of debate among varying Christian denominations in the latter days, so its inclusion can be seen as fulfilling an important purpose of the Book of Mormon to merge with the Bible onto the confounding of false doctrines and laying down of contentions and establishing peace. So you could also interpret it that way. You could interpret it that they were having this dispute you know, at this time in their Nephite ancient context, what was happening with the Lamanites, what was happening perhaps in their culture. You could also view it as like this is uh, an inspired insertion by Mormon and the Book of Mormon is for our day and was for the day, the people in Joseph Smith's day and that this was a relevant uh, point of doctrine to be addressed to clarify and to confound some of the false doctrines and teachings that were going about. So let's have a look at what Clyde D. Ford has to say uh, this comes from his article, Lehi on the Great Issues, Book of Mormon Theology in Early 19th Century Perspective. So he says, although the Book of Mormon contains teachings that are similar to those to various early 19th century groups, clearly Book of Mormon Theology does not consistently reproduce any existing early 19th century theological perspective. Indeed, I would suggest that previous scholars who have attempted to pigeonhole the Book of Mormon Theology create a methodological problem for themselves as they are forced to emphasize the similarities and minimize the differences between Book of Mormon teachings and their presumed early 19th century source. So he's saying that they are emphasizing the similarities and the parallels to 19th century teachings in the Book of Mormon and not evaluating some of the differences. As this study shows, it is often a close examination of the differences that can provide some of the more interesting insights. The Book of Mormon presents neither completely early 19th century Arminian or, nor Calvinistic theology, but sometimes offers as its resolution of the problem of moral evil shows a compromise between the two and at other times a unique perspective, such as the question of accountability for those not exposed to Christian teaching. There are other relatively novel theological ideas in the Book of Mormon. One example is the notion that the creation was entirely static prior to the fall. A, corolla a, a corollary of this concept is that the first humans could not have children. Additional studies will likely produce further valuable insights for students of both early Mormon history and early 19th century America on theological diversity. Uh, so let's look at some of the key doctrines. This is another criticism. If the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel, then why is there so many of key LDS doctrines not in the Book of Mormon? This was a question I had as a missionary. And is you know, critics would just conclude that the reason those doctrines aren't in the Book of Mormon is that it's very much a 19th century Protestant theology book, Protestant Christianity, and that Joseph Smith hadn't invented or come up with those theologies until later, and that's why they're not in the Book of Mormon, because he didn't believe in them in 1829 when he dictated it. And some of those doctrines include baptism for the dead, uh, temple marriage being required for exaltation, celestial marriage for time and all eternity, that salvation in the highest kingdom requires going through the endowment ceremony, uh, multiple priests or the Melchizedek priesthood. Actually, I will correct that one. It does talk about Melchizedek priesthood in a chapter in the Book of Mormon, I believe it's uh, it's a chapter in Alma that's all about the Melchizedek priesthood. So that one's not correct. But the sacrament should include water. I would say that's a specific revelation to the Doctrine and Covenants, the Word of Wisdom, the Garden of Eden being in Missouri. 
So uh, how can the Book of Mormon, this is Farah's response, contain the fullness of the gospel if it does not speak of ordinances such as baptism for the dead or celestial marriage? So is this a problem? So this is their response. It is possible that the Book of Mormon cannot contain... I'll do it again. Is it possible that the Book of Mormon cannot contain the fullness of the gospel because it doesn't teach certain unique LDS doctrines, such as baptism for the dead, the word of wisdom, three degrees of glory, celestial marriage, precarious work for the dead, and the corporeal nature of God the Father. Yeah, because even the Godhead isn't explicitly taught in the Book of Mormon. I don't know if I will go so far as to say the Book of Mormon teaches a modalistic view of God. Uh, I'm not covering that in this episode, but I refer you to the video that I did did on Joseph's Theology of God and with Robert Boylan, where we talked about was Joseph Smith a modalist between 1829 to 1834. We address some of those modalistic sounding passages, talking about Jesus being both the Father and the Son, the Eternal Father. But we have a look at other passages which seem to go against this. Uh, so it's not necessary that he definitely was a modalist, that the Book of Mormon reflects this. But there isn't a clear teaching about the nature of God and having a, a body so there's definitely uh, an evolution, or you could say further light knowledge concerning the understanding and the nature of God in LDS theology. There are many religious topics and doctrines which the Book of Mormon does not discuss in detail, and some which are not even mentioned. This is unsurprising, since the Book of Mormon's goal is to teach the fullness of the gospel, the doctrine of Christ. What is the gospel as it is defined? Let me give you how the Lord defines the gospel. In these words, and verily I send to you, he that receiveth my gospel receiveth me, and he that receiveth not my gospel receiveth not me. And this is my gospel, repentance and baptism by the water, and then cometh the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, even the Comforter, which showeth all things and teacheth the peaceful things of the kingdom. So their response that the Book of Mormon is to teach the fullness of the gospel, and the fullness of the gospel is the doctrine of Christ, faith in Jesus Christ and his atonement, his sacrifice for us, repentance, baptism by immersion, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. That is the fullness of Christ's gospel, but it's not every single doctrine contained in there. And perhaps it is a incorrect assumption to assume that the Book of Mormon should contain all doctrine, and the restoration through Joseph Smith is revelation of both restoring true doctrines, which have maybe been corrupted, but also new revelation of beliefs and the fullness of the gospel and clarifying doctrine but that some of the doctrines and some of the revelations are new as well and perhaps these the book of mormon people didn't have the fullness of doctrine and light as we have such as the understanding of the kingdoms of glory or baptisms for the dead or eternal marriage Tad Callister in his book he also talks about some of the unique doctrines in the book of mormon such as the fall of adam and eve being a step forward in our progression, not being a simple big mistake as Christians believe. You know, baptism by immersion, baptismal covenants, original sin, infant baptism, the spirit world before the resurrection. Now, I know some critics wouldn't find those overly unique or distinct. Um, and they would say, like, you know, if, if, if the Book of Mormon is not just a 19th century text, then why aren't all those later unique LDS doctrines, which aren't in 19th century Methodist Christianity, why aren't they there? But I think some of them are somewhat unique. And some of these things could have also been discussed and addressed in early Christian history. And if you believe that Christ revealed himself to the Nephites, that prophets like Nephi, Jacob, Benjamin had visions, or an angel told them about Jesus Christ, if they were early Christians, it's not surprising that they're having some of these doctrinal discussions, disputes, and that these early Christian practices were being done. So the critics' conclusion would be that uh, something highlighted in the Book of Mormon overviews, which is to say that Nephi is writing about events that not even the people in the Old Testament had any awareness of. So they weren't aware of the name of Jesus Christ or these very explicit visions of Jesus Christ, you know, being baptized his ministry, knowing of Jesus Christ's name coming 600 years before the people in the Bible did is problematic from the perspective of scholars because the author of the Book of Mormon is familiar with the 19th century Christology and writes it into an ancient text. 
The apologetic response is to say that God revealed this to Nephi, perhaps because they would not be there for Jesus' life. But again, it has all the fingerprints of someone writing a 19th century view of Christianity directly into ancient times. This is another area where the Occam's razor tells us that the most logical answer is that the Book of Mormon is writing this, that is that the author is writing this in the 19th century. And I can totally understand this view, this interpretation that the Book of Mormon is talking about Christ before the Jews in the Old Testament, before they knew about Christ, having visions of Jesus' ministry and being baptized and having a very early Christology, baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ. Even like also acknowledged, you know, chapters like 2 Nephi 31 sounds very much like a 19th century Protestant theology of being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And again, some, some of what he is arguing, we'll probably discuss this when we talk about prophecies in the Book of Mormon, but a critic or a skeptic would say that these very specific prophecies about Jesus being baptized or uh, you know, knowing the name of Jesus Christ, his ministry, his resurrection, coming to visit the Nephites, that this is somebody who is aware of the New Testament, this is someone who is familiar with 19th century Christology, and he is just writing it into the Book of Mormon narrative, and this is just a 19th century Protestant book. This is probably a faithful conclusion on why Christianity in the Book of Mormon before Christ. Uh, this comes from Laodi Saints Q&A. Most of the Book of Mormon takes place prior to the coming of Christ, yet the Nephite scripture includes what many believe are uniquely Christian doctrines and terminology. We know from modern scripture that the gospel was revealed to Adam and other pre-Christian prophets. Just as the Lord restored the fullness of the gospel through Joseph Smith, so likewise, Jesus restored teachings to his church that had previously been taught prior to the apostasy of the Jews. Mormon who added and abridged most of the Book of Mormon lived after the visitation of Christ. His Christian understanding and hindsight would certainly have influenced his retelling of events. So he's arguing that, uh, that what many people believe are, that are uniquely Christian doctrines and terminology and teachings before the coming of Christ, this seems out of place. This seems anachronistic or problematic. But according to Latter-day Saint belief and our scripture, we believe the gospel was revealed to Adam and other pre-Christian prophets and that it was then restored, the fullness of the gospel, through Joseph Smith and that this could have been lost to the Jews but then uh, revealed to the Nephites. Mormon as well, would have been involved as a Christian after the visitation of Christ in abridging and in his editing of the Nephite record. Perhaps this could be his insertion. Joseph Smith translated the plates into the common scriptural vernacular of his day, King James English. He, like Mormon, would have translated the text into familiar concepts and terminology. For example, some detractors have criticized the Book of Mormon for using the French word adieu, claiming that surely the Nephites didn't speak French. No, and neither do they speak English, and yet we have an English translation. Joseph used terms in his vocabulary to convey the intended meaning of the Book of Mormon text. The same thing is true for the Book of Mormon's use of the word Christ. And, and I think as well, you could attribute it, uh, some of this to Mormon's editing, abridgment, and redaction of the Nephite records, but I think it's most likely Joseph Smith's role as the translator, uh, him translating it into 19th century English, which would account for King James Bible passages, which would account for the 19th century sounding vernacular and phrases. And this is him translating this ancient text into terminology and vocabulary that would be relevant to the 19th century Christian audience as well. Whether or not you believe it was loose translation being channeled to Joseph Smith or coming uh, on the stone. But I can completely understand the critic's perspective that this 19th century Christology and the theology, this is just coming from Joseph Smith's milieu and environment, from revivals, sermons, the disputes that they're having in his day. And he's just taking that from his environment and attributing it to these fictional characters. And it doesn't contain all these later LDS doctrines that we have because he hadn't came up with them yet. I, I can get that, that criticism. So conclusion, this has been another long episode. Critics point to the Book of Mormon being a 19th century book because it seems to contain 19th century theology. Discussing and addressing many 19th century doctrinal disputes 
and having a presenting a Christology before Christ came, you know, repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Critics point to this as evidence of anachronism and the Book of Mormon being a 19th century text. Joe Smith just pulling this from his religious environment milieu. Apologetic arguments could be that the 19th century Christianity in the Book of Mormon could be the redactions or edits by Mormon or Joseph Smith in his role as the translator into 19th century terminology, vocabulary, language, phraseology, or perhaps being an expansion of the text. That was Blake Oster's view of Nephi's vision of you know, his father's dream and with the angel referring to, you know, the devil and church and, you know, baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ for their mission of sins, that this could be an expansion or explanation coming from Joseph Smith. There could have been pre-Christ baptisms and infant baptism in the cultural context. Early theological controversies over these topics didn't necessarily originate in 19th century America, and these could have been disputes the Nephites were having anciently. And some of those things could have been having if there was early Christology, they had these Christian doctrines and teachings, then it's very possible that they could have been having similar disputes and discussions over these things. And that the Book of Mormon also was meant for a 19th century audience as well, for the religious people of the day. And you could have believed that the inclusion such as of Moroni 8, Mormon's letter about infant baptism, was an inspired insertion for the people of that day to confound some of the false doctrines and religious disputes they were having. Uh, the Book of Mormon also contains doctrines not in 19th century milieu, such as maybe the doctrine of the fall, which aren't maybe so easily explained as Joseph Smith just taking it from his religious environment. Some people might have any sources where Joseph Smith may have been pulling this from, you're welcome to share it. I think I've heard some people speculate that Hiram could have got it from Dartmouth College, perhaps from a minister there. Uh, I've not researched much on that. Uh, and the last chrism about the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel, the atonement, faith, repentance, and baptism, but not necessarily all doctrine. So it was maybe our misunderstanding of fullness of the gospel means it contains every doctrine that was later revealed, you know, baptism for the dead, kingdoms of glory, uh, very clear outline of the plan of salvation, eternal marriage, that should all be there in the Book of Mormon, uh, but it's not. And perhaps it was our misunderstanding of what the fullness of the gospel means. So that was kind of a long episode. Um, if you've enjoyed it, uh, please like, share, and subscribe. In the next video, we're going to be looking at some of the errors or changes to the Book of Mormon, but there's been some revisions or changes to the text of the Book of Mormon grammar but then also changing like Mosiah to Benjamin and Mary being the mother of God to the mother of the son of God and we're going to be looking at how could there be changes made if this is a pure translation of an ancient text by the gift and power of God if this is the word of God how can there be errors or changes made to the Book of Mormon so we're going to look at that in the next episode uh, if you've enjoyed this one please give it a like uh, check out the links in the description do your own research as well and I'm trying to be fair and balanced uh, and give me some feedback as well, what you've thought of this video. And I'll see you next time on Moronism with the Mer. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone for watching this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a like, share it with others who might benefit, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. You can also listen to these episodes on podcast form on Anchor or Spotify, and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Check out my website, for more content, personal blog, and more. And if you care to donate to support me, you can via my PayPal or Patreon or through the website. And you can also give donations via YouTube through Super Chats. Thanks for watching Mormonism with the Mer. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone for watching this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a like, share it with others who might benefit, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. You can also listen to these episodes on podcast form on Anchor or Spotify, and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Check out my website for more content, personal blog, and more. And if you care to donate to support me, you can via my PayPal or Patreon, or through the website, and you can also give donations via YouTube through Super Chats. Thanks for watching Mormonism with the Mer. Take care. Bye-bye.